Do you need to rotate your crops when you have a small garden? This is a question that I get from the Geek Crew nonstop. And it is because quite often we are limited with space, whether it's raised beds or in ground. And what does that even mean if you're constantly mixing soil, remixing containers, or rototilling up your garden? So today's video, we're going to look at when it is necessary to rotate your crops, when it is not necessary to rotate your crops, how to prevent the potential of having to rotate your crops, and everything else in between. So let's jump into it. If you don't know who I am, hi, hello, my name's Ashley. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Soil Science, so I may know what I'm talking about to some extent. And the comment section is actually where you want to head to, because that is the Geek Crew. And that Geek Crew is going to know more about your situation specifically than I ever will. So do you want very specific info about your region? Just comment down below. Hey, I'm new around here. I currently am trying to garden in XYZ area. What tips and tricks do you have for me? And you'd be shocked by the outpouring of love and support you will get. And I try to get to as many of your comments as I possibly can as well. Now let's get into probably one of my top five most asked questions. Do I rotate my crop? So here's where the idea of crop rotation came from. It actually came from the world of farming which is my bread and butter and kind of where I know everything from and actually is where a bulk of my training has come from. And the reason why farmers with hundreds of acres will rotate crops is because there are diseases out there, fusarium wilt, club root, tinea, you name it, all of which will annihilate acres upon acres upon acres of crop if we don't have a proper crop rotation. Now, the idea or the reason why this happens is because if you constantly put the host plant in a position year after year and a problem comes around, whether it be insect, bacterial, or fungal, if that problem takes root in that space and you continue to just give it its host plant, you are ultimately just feeding the problem, which exasperates the problem. And eventually you'll get to the point where you can't grow that crop there at all. And you may not be able to grow that crop there at all for several years, depending on the dormancy of that issue in particular. And just a heads up, if it is a fungal issue, it is a major amount of downtime before you can actually move back into that space with the crop that you've been having issues with. And this is actually so severe that oftentimes there will be signage, for example, like stop club root from trying to transfer it over state or provincial borders because it is so detrimental to the economy. Now, your little garden probably doesn't factor into this. So if you don't have the space to actually rotate your crops, then let's look at what you can do alternatively or what crop rotation would look like for you. The idea of rotation is to break cycles. So the cycle may be that we need to break is around fungal or bacterial issues. Maybe it's around insects in their overwintering. It could be even around nutrient depletion. So for example, if you have a corn plant or tomato, a very heavy eater constantly in the same space, you'll end up with a nutrient depleted soil that you should probably consider putting something like peas or beans onto to help replenish it in some way or give it a little bit of a break. So the idea is to break the cycle, regardless of what cycle you're trying to break. And sometimes we don't always know what cycle we're trying to break, break, which is kind of why we crop rotate, regardless of the signs and symptoms that our crops are showing us. So and actually a really great example of this for us gardeners is plants in the nightshade family. So plants in the nightshade family can include peppers, eggplants, and tomatoes, as well as potatoes, oddly enough. And so because they're all in the same family, they can end up with the exact same pest pressures. And there are fusariums or blights that in particular can be detrimental to these crops and they can overwinter or over decade ish in your garden no problemo without any nightshade plant being present so this one in particular can overwinter or over season for up to five years so this means for five years you would not be able to grow eggplant tomato peppers or potatoes in that space without a problem so if you've identified some sort of blight issue within your crop and you keep on having the same issues, this is a sign that you may want to choose to not grow tomatoes in that area. So if it is a in-ground bed, you would want to plant the tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, eggplants on the absolute opposite side. If it's a container, 
you would want to make sure that that container that you plant them in is nowhere near the container it was planted in last year. If it's raised beds, ideally, they'd be on opposite ends of the yard. If at all possible, you would have them in the front yard where there was no disease last year. And then backyard, you would be growing something entirely different. There wouldn't be any shade, nightshade plants in the backyard where you have been experiencing that blight. Now, unfortunately, in some cases, you may just have to forego nightshades or really cut back on nightshades for, you know, five years-ish until that population has died out. So this next one, I believe, personally, is incredibly important to keep our eyes out for. And that is club root. So club root is something that once it's in the soil, can take up to 17 years to disappear. So needless to say, you probably aren't going to be growing many brassicae species in that area in your lifetime. So this can include things like cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflowers, literally anything in the brassicae family. And so a really good rule about this whole brassicae world is to rotate them every single year. If you can't do it every single year, then you're going to want to aim for that three to five year mark. So, so far, we have a tally of nightshade plants that need to be moved if they are showing signs of issues. They don't have to be removed if they are moved around, if they haven't shown any signs. We have brassicae plants that either you're going to choose to not grow at all, or if you choose to grow, you want to make sure they're in a different spot every single year, if at all possible, with the absolute max being around that three-year mark, ideally. Now, here's the good news. There's actually several crops that we grow in our garden that have a low, if not zero risk of disease issues that can overwinter inside the soil on the plant debris or in the kind of mulch area of your garden. So this includes leafy greens, pretty much all herbs, peas and beans, while they can get fusarium, usually pretty manageable if you ask me, a vast majority of ornamentals, cut flowers, and squash-ish, depending on how you are Dealing with powdery mildew, to say the least, if you're having a lot of powdery mildew issues, I would actually encourage you to remove all of the upper biomass and the mulch from the infected area. But if you don't have powdery mildew issues or if powdery mildew is your only issue, these are pretty low on the scale of problems that you tend to have. So here's the ultimate truth about all of these items or all of these plants. The nature of a home gardener is much different than the nature of these massive monocropped farms. Monocropped farms with acres and acres of just canola or wheat or peas or whatever the case is, reacts and treats pests and disease issues much different than a garden. The reason being is that you are naturally breaking cycles without rotating anything. So the way in which our garden actually counteracts the whole lack of crop rotation is via things like better airflow, different kinds of mulches or constant mulching, which are actually, surprisingly enough, is enough of an interface between the soil and the plant to sometimes suppress certain pests and or the constant laying of new mulch is enough to prevent the kick up of things like spores or bacteria onto the leaves when it rains or is irrigated. There also is just the biodiversity factor. If you aren't just doing beds of tomatoes, and you're alternating between tomatoes and squash and beets and everything's kind of interplanted together. Lots of like you know, flowers, for example, That's a lot of what I teach you guys to do. All of these things actually help to counteract that. So in and of itself, that is a form of crop rotation that acts very similar. So just keep that in mind. So if you don't have the room to crop rotate or it's simply just something you're not able to track, here are the steps that you want to take to ensure that you don't have to crop rotate now or in the future. Number one is get disease resistant varieties of tomatoes or whatever crop are your favorite. Ensure that you are constantly adding new mulch to remove the slash back factor, if you will. Whenever possible, make sure you're adding compost or manures, both of which are going to have a lot of beneficial microbes that actually will go in and be predatory to your problem issues that you may have. You also want to include that you're increasing biodiversity. So don't just do entire rows of tomatoes. Make sure you're interplanting marigolds or cosmos or vining plants, for example. Whenever possible, make sure you're removing diseased material. So this means 
removing the plant debris on the soil surface, both currently while it's diseased and or in the fall, if that is the case. This stands for powdery mildew, you know, cucumber beetles, you name it. You have to let me know in the comments down below if you believe with all your heart and soul that there is something that is, if there is something that has happened in your garden that you truly think crop rotation would have helped you be saved by. If you're interested to know what you guys say in the comments down below, there was nothing in my case that I think crop rotation would save me from to date when it comes to gardening specifically. And I can say that with confidence. So anyways, I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.